So I actually enjoyed this chapter, well this page, because it really puts things in perspective for me. So just enjoy, listen as I read, okay? Um, so prior to this, we're talking about this author, and I believe it's Didion who wrote the book Democracy, and in it she describes that you know, Hawaii was a great place, and then there was World War II. And when she says that, you know, Hawaii's history started in, let's say, I want to say like 1842, it makes people believe that Hawaii didn't have any people inhabiting it, right? Like Hawaii was just some land, and then the white people came, and they built houses and stuff, and so now it's Hawaii which is a big part of history that a lot of children are taught. Like, I'm not taught that there was people, well, like, I was taught it in school, you know, during Thanksgiving, remember, like, the Native Americans were on the land, but there's a lot of things that I wasn't taught. Like, yes, there was some killing, but who cares? We gotta move on and forget about it. I feel like that's the biggest thing, and it's easy to forget about it, because we have people like different authors specifically erasing history, but again, like, if you're on the conspiracy side of things, you know that there was a lot of floods, there was a lot of fires, there was a lot of burning of cities and stuff, and books and all of that, and hit hiding of books, especially. And then when you have people that are, like, incarcerated right now, they can't even get certain books in their libraries. And that's what one of my friends told me, and, like, I kind of got it, but, like, I also don't get it. But, because I'm like, yeah, some books can be explicit, you know, they can be about selling illegal substances, but, like, really to ban certain books, it could just be because the books have a lot of knowledge and they don't want the inmates to see. So let's go into the page. To hear Didion tell the story, you would never know, in the mathematical sense of, of course, that anyone lived in Hawaii at all before the great great grandfather of hers came in as a missionary to whom in 1842. The only time she mentions Queen Lili Ukalani it's to describe the possessions Didion's white family members took from Hawaii upon emigrating to California, their token mementos, the calabashes and carved palace chairs, and the flat silver 48, and the diamond that had been Queen Lila Kalani, and the heavy linens embroidered on all the golden afternoons that were so no more. Hawaiian Sugar Planters Association, founded in 1895, actively recruited migrant labor to work on its plantations. They opened Philippine offices in Manila, in the city where my father is from, Digan, the capital of Iloko Sur. By 1906, Filipino laborers, alongside Japanese migrant laborers, whom the solidarity was complicated and tenuous were working on Hawaii sugar plantations only four years after the end of the Philippine-American War. The grueling labor conditions and relentless racial discrimination they faced meant that in the first half of the 20th century, Filipinos long stereotyped as violent actors prone to fits of emotion and criminality were the number one race in Hawaii to be sentenced with the death penalty. During the 1924 Hanapepe massacre, 16 Filipinos were murdered during an organized labor strike with over 100 arrested and tried, and around 50 imprisoned and later deported. The massacre effectively marked, in many ways, the end of the labor movement in Hawaii during that period. Some of the names Didion remembers. Didion remember, mentions. Castle and Cook, Alexander and Baldwin, C. Brewer and Co. Company, Theo H. Daisies and Company were part of the Big Five, the oligarchic group of settler colonial owned sugarcane corporations in Hawaii, which amassed significant political power during the earliest, earlier 20th century, largely throwing their weight behind the Hawaiian Republican Party. 
At one point, Didion even uses the word antebellum Hawaii, making parallels unmistakable, unmistakable, casting herself as Scarlet Bohara of the islands, bemoaning a bygone paradise. Paradise for who? Of course, who? The white people, right? The rich white people who own up everything, mourning the loss of our way of life. None of the other degenerate colonials remember the islands the way she does. The entire essay is essentially a not like the other girls argument about which type of white settler loves Hawaii the best. In fact, there is perhaps no description that captures Didion's work better than to say that it is consummate pick me writing. Her piteous colonially inflected reportage and the wider misapprehension of Didion's style and what oh, Didion style as unsentimental. Usually a dog whistle phrasing for unfeminine, thank God, is at the very core of Didion's cultural popularity and critical approval. When Didion is praised often in a specific kind of chioroscuro, She's not like other women writers, if I must contribute to the competition, and the drunk white colonial, colonial dame having hot sex in Asia genre of literature. I prefer Marguerite Duras and the white American woman excoriating her oppressive aristocratic background genre of literature. I prefer Edith Wharton. And I like how she made up these genres because, like, honestly, that should be a genre that is a real genre. Didion makes little to no mention of the colonial war of 1893, during which the kingdom of Hawaii was overthrown in a coup d'etat, and Queen Lulu Kalani removed from power by a U.S.-backed majority foreign, back when white people at least knew they were foreign to Hawaii, insurgency. Her wealth appropriated by people like Didion's family, Didion never once considers that this war is that is Hawaii's true origin, originary disaster that for some every day since 1893 has been another Pearl Harbor. In 1898, the islands were annexed to the United States, all so that years and years later, families just like Didion's could look down at that island from their great houses in the hills and sing to you the long, lovely song about the kake and the pineapple and the trade winds and the long and lovely song about how much Hawaii means to them after they fucking stole it, after they freaking stole it. So this is uh, her criticism and I like it so much. Hmm, is this what writers do? Force themselves to never look down into the depths beneath the tightrope they're walking just in order to write. There's a deliberately mystifying and self-aggrandizing tenor to this way of thinking about the holy work of the writer that I've never found truthful, not alone helpful. This writing is a sleight of the hand as a balancing act, writing as a parlor trick to be pulled off, not writing as a practice of being in the world, being of the world. So this is another quote that I liked. One could be released from a useless binding repulsive past into a kind of historylessness, a blank page waiting to be inscribed. That was paramount for white settler colonials to believe this lie that the land they were occupying was a blank page waiting to be inscribed, that this, it, it was this lie that allowed America to tell the story of itself and fifth-generation white Californians like Didion to tell the story of California. It's the lens through which all writing about the West must be scrutinized. Who is this writing for? What vision of California and the West is it upholding? So for me, it just is saying how like America and history of places is erased a lot and that we want to just have this new life, this new start, and there's no history behind it. I write my own story, but that's not true. We are all holding the DNA of like 
the first living person ever you know we're all connected and when someone else is hurting like that can literally affect you you know like let's say you eat food and you want to have it be healthy and well prepared well you can't do that if the city you're living in has a lot of people that are like traumatized and hurt and don't have good parents and family and community you know so yeah that's what i'm thinking we're all connected